This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Hello and welcome to The Hub. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. How do you feel about reaching a milestone nobody wants to see? I'm talking about 100 million. Only it is not just a number, but millions of broken lives and families. In May this year, 2022, the number of refugees, internally displaced persons, and asylum seekers crossed 100 million, which is more than 1% of the world's total population. Which places were the worst hit? Where did the displaced people go? And how is the United Nations Refugee Organization coping with this unprecedented crisis? Now, Mr. Barbara Baluch is Senior Regional Spokesperson of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, or UNHCR. He's joining us today from Bangkok, Thailand, to talk about the tragedy of displaced and stateless people. Mr. Baluch, welcome to the Hub on CGTN. Thank you. Before we start looking at the major refugee crises around the world, which are many, I want to talk about the 100 million people mark. It is a very sad milestone like many other milestones, for every one of them, there is a harrowing story of loss and suffering and broken families. Would you say that the situation has generally deteriorated or improved in the 21st century? Uh, indeed, I mean, as you mentioned, 100 million people being displaced in today's modern world is a staggering and a huge number. Uh, sadly, what we have seen last the 10, 15 years that globally, the number of people who are forced out of their homes and countries has been on the rise. And this is happening because of conflict, because of wars, uh, because of persecution. This number of 100 million was half just a decade ago, and now it has doubled and it has crossed the 100 million mark. Half of these people uh, who have been forced out of their homes and towns and villages are inside their own country. Uh, and nearly uh, 30 million more have been uh, forced to leave their countries to seek refuge uh, in the region and, and beyond their neighboring countries as well. The issue that we want to highlight uh, while we are telling people about the sad milestone of 100 million people being displaced is if the world does not get its act together, it does not try to resolve conflicts and also stop the new ones coming up, we are going to see uh, more and more people being affected, sadly. Right. You know, there are a lot of people who are questioning the efficacy of the work of the United Nations or multilateral institutions. They say that at the end of the day, it is the nation states who are making the ultimate decisions, especially those within their borders. Do you think the United Nations Refugee Agency is now better equipped to address the situation than, say, 10 years or 20 years ago? UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency, has been around for over seven decades right now. This agency was created to support people who were affected by World War II. And the whole idea was once we are done with that job, the agency will not need to exist. We are an agency who would like to see ourselves out of the job as soon as possible. But the reality, the sad reality of this world since the last 70, 75 years has been that we have not seen one conflict ending and another one not starting. So this has been the nature of the work. We have been able to help millions and millions of people restarting their lives in all parts of the world, like the pandemic. The war, uh, it, there's no region in the world which has not been affected by war and, and conflict. So you see from the Americas, now in Europe with the Ukraine crisis, in Africa, in Asia, in Middle East, every corner of the world has been affected. That's where we uh, step in to support. And indeed, I mean, majority of the displaced are within their own countries, within the borders. 
And those countries also need help. And many of the refugees that have gone in the neighboring regions, uh, those communities are, 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 they do not have enough resources to even support themselves. So, so when refugees go there, they need support as well. So our work collectively is not only a work of uh, specialized agencies. This work is behalf of everyone in this world. This work is on behalf of humanity. Many would argue that the right to survive is uh, among the very basic human rights. And the Asia Pacific region, unfortunately and tragically, is among the worst hit when it comes to the number of internally displaced people and refugees. And as regional spokesperson for Asia Pacific, uh, of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. You tweeted on many occasions on the plight of Rohingya refugees, that is a stateless Muslim minority in Myanmar. Uh, the last exodus began in August 2017 when violence broke out yet again in Rohan state of Myanmar, driving more than three quarters of a million people to the neighboring Bangladesh. Most people arrived in the first three months of the crisis, mainly women, children, and the elderly people. What is the UNHCR doing to help? I mean, give us a sense of the stakes there. We have around a million Rohingya refugees uh, that have been uh, in uh, Bangladesh. I mean, uh, the, the, the big chunk, the big numbers uh, have been there for five years, but there are other refugee, Rohingya refugees that have been there uh, before that as well. So UNHCR is working hand in hand with uh, the Bangladeshi government and the host communities to support the Rohingya uh, refugees. Uh, sadly, uh, that situation is also finishing five years now. As we support refugees and the host communities, as I was saying, that majority of refugees go to the neighboring countries, not only to get support, uh, but also they go there with the hope that one day they will be able to go back uh, to, to their country, to their homes, to their towns and, and villages. Sadly, at this time, the situation uh, is, is, is not something that they can choose to return now now but they, they they are keeping that hope alive but till the time refugees are in their host communities they need support and and they need support from basic uh, human things that we need to survive uh, to something like education for their children as well uh, many of those rohingya refugees are under the age of 18 children so unitcr is working hand in hand with the authorities but also our partners our donors our supporters to keep that hope alive yeah it takes a village uh, to help those refugees uh, as the regional director is there any other regional hotspots mr baluch that you want to highlight to our audience because our shows are uh, broadcasted not only in asia pacific but also around the world uh, indeed, I mean, if we stay in Asia, the other uh, situation that we UNHCR has been involved for four decades is Afghanistan. Uh, Afghanistan has been going through phases of conflict for the last 40 years and UNHCR has stayed with Afghan people inside the country, but also in the neighboring countries in providing support to, to, to Afghans who have been affected by this prolonged conflict. Uh, so currently we have some 3.5 million Afghans who are displaced inside their country. More than 2 million Afghans are in the neighboring countries. And since the event of August, uh, last year, the humanitarian situation has become very, very challenging. And Afghans today, they deserve the world's attention. And, and I, was, I was in Afghanistan uh, for a month and a half after uh, the Taliban uh, took over uh, control in Kabul and in the country. And I was able to go visit UNHCR projects uh, uh, in, in different parts of the country. And, and one could see being on the ground how desperate that situation is. So also the appeal to the world when they look to other crises uh, which are very prominent globally, the, our appeal is not to forget situations like the Rohingya or people in Afghanistan or in Afghanistan's neighboring countries. 
girls getting a proper education that is so important. When you talk about refugees, many people think about wars. But in recent years, climate change seems to exacerbate the situation, and the number of climate change-related refugees is growing. Um, what is it like to be a climate change refugee? I mean, can you help us understand uh, what's at stake here? I think what we are looking right now is the reality of our world: war, conflict, climate change, natural disaster. It all just compounds all the problem that this world has. And as it has been repeated and reminded uh, many times, there is no planet B for humanity or human beings. So this is the planet that we have to love, we have to care for, and we have to nurture. Where What we have seen is uh, with the displacement crisis, many, many locations where we have seen climate change at work as well, which, which affects uh, people who are already displaced. And then I was just talking to you about Afghanistan. Afghanistan has uh, uh, been in conflict for four decades, but recently it has been going through uh, uh, phases of droughts as well. Food insecurity, where Afghans are going to get their second meal is a huge challenge for them. When we talk about Rohingyas in Bangladesh, remember about rains, about flooding, uh, in terms of how climate has changed. One good thing that we have seen over there is that communities and refugees have come together uh, trying uh, to find a way uh, where we uh, are, 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 are putting in place more effective climate friendly initiatives uh, trying to take care of, 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 of Mother Earth, uh, but also uh, trying to make sure that people who are in those areas, they are safe and secure. It is a reality. Uh, we have to work hand in hand in, in terms of trying to uh, take care of our planet, but also the people as well. Right. Mr. Baluch, once people have been forced to flee from their homes, they become prey to smugglers, traffickers, and criminals, right? Those secondary disasters, if you will. Um, what is your organization doing to help those people in that regard? Uh, indeed, it's a big risk, a uh, huge danger. And what we have seen a sense of desperation increases. Uh, people smugglers and traffickers, they prey on the vulnerable. This is what we saw uh, in 2015 and 16. Uh, remember how people were exploiting uh, refugees uh, who were taking the risky route in, in, in the Mediterranean. This is also we see in the sense of desperation that the Rohingyas have in terms of trying to take boats uh, to other destination. This is the same phenomena that we have seen uh, many of Afghans who, uh, who have been uh, kind of trying to risk their lives uh, to reach uh, to safety. These dangers are there. These, these dangers are real. And we engage with not only with uh, the refugee communities and the host communities, but also uh, with authorities all around the world. And, and, and the effort is uh, that we, if we are able to help and support refugees, host communities trying to address root causes of the sense of desperation or what is happening on the ground, uh, there is a way to uh, to kind of uh, uh, avoid people getting into these traps. Uh, the problem is there's not enough support uh, uh, available for these refugees. They don't see a way out of the many situations, the sense of desperation they see for themselves and their, for their children. The only way they see sometimes, sadly, uh, is, is, is to hand over themselves to, to the human traffickers and smugglers. We know one thing, these human traffickers and smugglers do not care for human lives. Uh, and we have seen so many tragedies happening in the high seas, on the roads, on the highways, in the jungles, on the borders. This is something that we must work together collectively to save human lives. It does take uh, international solidarity to solve those issues on the high seas uh, across the continents indeed. Uh, uh, Mr. Bellucci posted recently a tweet, uh, actually a couple of weeks ago, saying that forced displacement can end when conditions improve in the countries of origin and that refugees can go back in safety and dignity. 
You mentioned 300 people in Cameroon who recently returned to the Central African Republic, but some would argue that it is a drop in the ocean. Uh, are there any successful examples on a large scale? Do you expect, say, refugees from Syria or Afghanistan to, to be able to return home at some point? Uh, this just shows one thing. I mean, when you become a refugee, when you are forced out without your choice of your home, your towns, your, your villages and your countries, uh, the, the desire to return home always stays with you. And we have seen it many occasions where refugees see themselves being able to return home, they do so. And, and, and we do not need to tell refugees when it is the time. They are the best decision makers in terms of knowing what is happening on the ground. And it is at the end their decision to return home, but we have seen it in many continents where that opportunity is there, people do go back home. Uh, and this is over the last 70 years as, as UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency, we have helped millions of people to return back home. Mr. Belush, I want to talk about Ukraine, which is unfortunately fading out of the international media spotlight as the war drags on and uh, against the backdrop of where the war has no sign of ending in sight. Uh, according to the UNHCR websites, as of June 2022, some 7.3 million border crossings have been recorded from Ukraine, with another 2.3 million crossings back into the country. What is the situation like on the ground right now? Uh, indeed, and that's the sad reality of our times. Uh, we already had uh, enough crisis and conflicts going on, and and with this crisis uh, in terms of mass displacement and tragedies and effect on human lives, we sadly have seen more than 16 million people being displaced inside Ukraine and also as refugees in the neighboring uh, countries as as well. Uh, we hope that this does not drag long. We hope there's a resolution to this uh, senseless war that people are able to reestablish, restart their lives. We don't see years and years passing without any uh, resolution. The reality of the day is people are displaced inside the countries and outside the country. They need humanitarian uh, support where they are right now and also in, in the neighboring uh, countries as, as well. One thing that we have seen and what Ukraine has taught us is that when a mass displacement crisis happens, when the local communities come together to help refugees and displaced, when the governments, when the humanitarians, or when private sector businesses come together, it is possible to take care of a large uh, uh, population that, ha uh, that has been uh, displaced. And this is the example we want to, to see in every situation. As you mentioned, mm. uh, uh, that when things are in media, people can see it and then it slowly starts to, to disappear. That does not mean that the needs have gone away. That does not mean that the conflict has gone away. That's why we are telling people uh, if our focus is on uh, Ukraine, it's good because this is the right thing to do in terms of our humanity. We also have to remember that there are many other situations that deserve and need our attention to. We're talking about Ukraine. What type or what kind of resettlements programs do you expect if and when the war ends? When we talk about resettlement, resettlement happens uh, for refugees uh, who are in, in their host uh, uh, communities where they are being hosted, when there's uh, no way out for, for them and there is a need for uh, them to be resettled somewhere else, uh, then that, uh, that, that starts. And it also depends in terms of what circumstances those refugees are. The needs in terms of globally for refugees to be resettled are huge. Sadly, the numbers that are available uh, from different countries who want to resettle refugees, uh, that number is very small. So an appeal here is also when refugees need that resettlement option, which at times can be life-saving, 
that space has to be there. Yeah, Mr. Baluch, I want to talk about the migrant crisis we saw in Europe and across the United States. Over the years, we saw a lot of people crossing the Central American states into Mexico and from America's southern borders into the United States. And also a lot of immigrants, migrants are moving from Northern Africa and the Middle East to European countries. Uh, basically, and largely, they're flowing from the global south to the developed countries. How would you describe the challenges they are facing and uh, that type of migrant crisis, if you will? I think we first we have to make a distinction in terms of uh, a refugee and a migrant. A refugee is someone who is forced out of their homes. So they have just no choice at all. Migrant in terms of its definition are people who are looking uh, for a better opportunity in uh, other other places. Uh, uh, so this distinction is very important. While we are trying to see how the world responds uh, to the migration issues, we have to be mindful that among those groups, there are individuals uh, who need uh, a, to find a place of safety, which we call it international protection. What we are asking for, one is to humanly treat everyone. Number two is please put in place mechanism that can clearly tell you who is someone who needs support in terms of safety uh, and, and who are others uh, who, in case they return home, they are safe. This distinction is very, very important. Thank you for pointing out that this very important distinction. But uh, despite this distinction, uh, one would argue that uh, both types of refugees and migrants are facing different sorts of challenges. And speaking of which, there are 6 million Venezuelan refugees and migrants added together worldwide. And they have escaped violence, insecurity, and lack of basic necessities like food and water in their home country. But the media seldom or rarely report on this uh, actually the world's second largest external displacement crisis. Tell us what is going on in the country, sir. Yeah, indeed. Uh, that's also really, really worrying. And that's when we, we, when we talk about media attention uh, uh, at one location, which is good. Uh, equally, people are suffering in many other parts of the world. And uh, the situation in Venezuela is one such uh, situation. Uh, like many other locations, what we have seen is even for when uh, people from Venezuela were forced out and they had to leave their country, the welcome has been there in the region, in the neighboring uh, countries. Many of those countries have come up uh, with, uh, with schemes uh, that have kind of uh, uh, accepted Venezuelans who were arrived there because there are regional arrangements where you don't need a, a visa uh, to travel to, where you get uh, uh, like a, a permit uh, to, to stay. Uh, and there are many others who have applied for asylum as, as well. So this kind of highlights the importance of countries in the region coming together as blocks, uh, providing that leadership and support when mass displacement happens. This helps us as humanitarians to respond to these situations more uh, easily, but the humanitarian needs uh, are there for uh, for those who, who have left Venezuela as, as well. And that's one situation because for us as humanitarians, we try to seek similar attention on all mass displacement situations around the globe. And this is one situation that we have been highlighting mm -hmm. from time to time quite constantly and persistently. Uh, let's talk about the role of China. In the past 20, 30 years, China has sent uh, numerous missions to the Gulf of Eden to help fight the pirates of Somalia, uh, to help with the patrolling missions of the United Nations. Also, China has built a logistics hub in Djibouti in Africa. How do you see the efforts of China uh, in aligning with the mandates of the UNHCR? 
Yeah, for us as humanitarians, I mean, we keep expanding our uh, our humanitarian partnerships, uh, and and we need more support, and that's why it's so good uh, to see uh, that China, as 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 a country, is stepping forward to to help the cause of of, of humanity. Uh, in in that list that you mentioned, you also need to keep uh, the the peacekeeping as 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 well. But what we have seen is as our partnership grows, it helps us to respond to the humanitarian situations far better. We need uh, that uh, leadership in terms of uh, supporting humanity and humanitarian uh, efforts. And that's why we, we quite encourage uh, to, to, to see that coming forward. As I was mentioning to you situations in, in Afghanistan, in Africa and other places uh, where uh, Ch uh, China is stepping forward to support our humanitarian work, it makes an impact. Uh, obviously, China is uh, balancing its policy of non-intervention on one hand and on the other trying its best to help those in need. Um, in 2017, the UNHCR chief Filippo Grante said, and I quote, that we hope China can invest resources directly in countries hosting large numbers of refugees. So going forward, how do you think China can play a more substantive and active role uh, within the works of the UNHCR? One thing that we have been trying to highlight, when you talk about countries that have been hosting a big number of refugees, we have seen that most of the time these countries are in the region, they are the neighboring countries, and majority of the world's refugees are hosted in communities uh, which uh, uh, are even uh, which need support even themselves, but they step forward to welcome refugees, share resources. We need support as as UNICR, as humanitarians, uh, that that support is provided to refugees and their host communities. In in our work of humanity, uh, we say that the world can collectively come together and provide that hope and 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 support and that's why it's so encouraging to see uh, china as a reliable partner in terms of our humanitarian initiatives and and the only hope is that it goes forward and gets stronger mr barbara baluch unhcr regional spokesperson for asia pacific thank you so much for coming to our show and thank you for the very important work that you've done and for highlighting all those very important issues for our audience Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much, sir. And that will do it for this edition of The Hub on CGTN. Thank you for watching. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. I'll see you again soon.